run your own AI cluster at home on your everyday devices, such as devices like, you know, your phone here and your laptop and a, another computer or no, basically anything. You can run uh, Python. It seems like Python, it needs to be able to run on it. They do have a demonstration of showing us how it can run on iPhones and iOS devices. Uh, obviously, you can only deploy Xcode apps onto those devices. Uh, it may be you could definitely run Python if you have terminal access, though you'd have to do, you know, uh, the, the, the jailbreaking. Uh, though it seems like all we have to do is forget expensive NVIDIA GPUs. Why bother with that? You already have some pretty decent graphics accelerators sitting around the house. Might as well unify your existing devices into a single powerful GPU. It says iPhone, iPad. Android, Mac, Linux, basically anything that can run Python. And it's a really, they make it really simple, which I, I like a lot. So they have some feature support here. Uh, wide model support, which means the very big language models. You can partition the layers across the devices. Uh, dynamic model partitioning, all right, so you can split up the model based on the current network topology, which is nice because it happens automatically based on the available resources on the device. It sort of takes a percentage of the GPU memory available on those devices and splits those layers across those devices so they can run on any single device and automatic d device discovery, which is neat. So I suppose in this case, every time you add a new device, it will append it to the network. And then they give you a really straightforward and simple uh, API, which is the chat Jippity API, right? You get to just interact with it exactly the same way that OpenAI's API has. So it makes it you know, universally accessible to any framework or other things that are accessing that, uh, that API. All right, here, so I see they do this, they, they call it device quality, but basically it's just they're saying it's not like other distributed interface frameworks. It doesn't have, you know, that master worker architecture instead, which I, I, this is important, it's critical. The, it can fail, right? There's, there's failure points or you have to have redundant duplicates of this. I, this is not my favorite design for distributed compute. I like the design of distributed compute of every system can interact with every other system and has copies of the data and they all know how to interact with each other without any sort of governance machines behind it. Uh, instead, they do have this peer-to-peer uh, -peer approach. As long as the device is connected somewhere on the network, it can be used to run the models. And it supports uh, various partitioning strategies across the devices, uh, which allows you to set a weight. So if you wanted to put more weight on one of the boxes that says, hey, you've got a lot of GPU memory over here, but really you only want to use a little bit of it, you can uh, program that into the system. Um, the way their distributed framework works is, oh, this is a little tiny. <laughs> Little, little tiny image here. Uh, the the way it works is uh, it's a ring token. Uh, the, it passes, it feeds for because large language models and machine learning today use matrix multiplications for feed world neural networks, and so every time you run a prompt, you have to run it as a feed forward. So every stage has to get executed by the next step. And so it's able to do that using this sort of pattern. It's like every device is running an interface in a ring where each device runs a number of model layers proportional to the amount of memory on the device. We're gonna run our own AI cluster at home on our regular devices, our consumer devices, our laptops, our phones, and things like that. We could run this a the AI models on all of our devices to get all the power and capability of the GPU memory and that's available on each of our devices, including your phone and a laptop. I'm gonna try it with just one device just to you know get it started. It's actually really simple. All you have to do is uh, copy. Obviously, you need Python 3.12 ready to go. So then you wanna copy this, uh, this code here and then we will be able to, uh, let's see here, let's give it a shot. All right, so we'll clone it in, we'll go in. We need to install, I do believe uh, before I pip install that I'm going to have to uh, source my, uh, there we go, and then, okay, yep, mm -hmm. all right, uh, let's see. There we go, pip install requirements, and then got to make sure you're in the right directory. <laughs> it's like a little bit of an important aspect uh, when you run that command. All right, so it'll install all of our components and that's it all we have to do then is run python main and then i will have an up and running cluster obviously i'm only running on one device here just for uh oh all right so we got some dependencies to resolve one second all right i found the problem right here uh, i'm testing it on a device that does not have apple silicon so like an m series chip right 
And so we, uh, that's a mandatory requirement, apparently for this repository. And so not being able, well then obviously you can't run it on Linux <laughs> unless you're using, I suppose, uh, an Apple M series chip. But in this case, uh, it is not going to run on my test system. So what we can do is we can at least just take a look at what the output would be. So it's very straightforward. We'd run Python main after installing all the dependencies, as long as you have the right Apple hardware, uh, which not everyone does, <laughs> right? Uh, then you could easily just run curl on that machine uh, using the open AI, the chat GPT compatible API endpoint. Uh, it's very straightforward and simple to do that. And then you'll get back a response. So they make it really easy to, to take care of distributing compute across all as long as you have Apple hardware. So it's possible that we can run large language models at home with uh, all of our devices working together as long as it's Apple Silicon hardware. We have a project called XO, E-X-O, that lets you run the large language models by sharing the power of all your devices collectively. I think it's really interesting that we can do this and they, they made it really simple, XO made it really simple. In order to do this, all you have to do is download and install the repository onto the devices and then execute main.py. It'll automatically connect all the devices together, process them uh, collectively anytime you submit a prompt into the device, the tail device, not the... Uh, it would be great if you could do it on any device uh, and it should be able to support that. They did mention that they currently do not. It only the tail device, so the last device to join the token network. And then you can power um, all of the LLM with the GPUs across. So th the, there's one major benefit to this is you'll be able to leverage the GPU memory across all these devices. And it's not necessarily going to make it any faster other than being able to make sure that you can do the matrix multiplications in the GPU itself because you have enough GPU memory shared across all the devices. In a feed for a neural network, you can do you can uh, submit a prompt, though it's still going to be blocked uh, by, uh, you know, it needs to feed forward to each matrix. Uh, so it's still going to not run all of these systems simultaneously and compute the power across all of them simultaneously, though you will be able to submit multiple requests and then be able to have multiple parallel quests going at once, allowing you to have a faster response time with more user load. That's where it's really going to shine from that perspective. Also that you'll be able to you know, leverage the compute of those GPUs directly because you have enough memory to do so. We're looking at EXO, the EXO library here that allows us to run large language models across all of our Apple devices using the Apple Silicon hardware to accelerate the large language model on a cluster that we run on our home network, which is really powerful because it allows us to leverage those GPU performances, all the capabilities. I'm actually kind of curious to look at the requirements.txt to see what libraries are being used in this project. Now we can see since it is a, uh, um, it's going to provide us an interface to be able to make an API call into the cluster to run a prompt, like to ask the model a question. Uh, it's going to uh, start with uh, a, it's like uh, asynchronous IO HTTP. Uh, even, though, even though this is an AI project, uh, AI in this case actually stands, is it an AIO for asynchronous inner, uh, for async IO, right? For AIO, so asynchronous input output. HTTP, which is a client server library that allows you to set up a server on a port to listen for incoming HTTP requests. And that's what fulfills the prompt, uh, the, the prompt system that you submit to it. Uh, we also have gRPC and the gRPC aspect uh, also with protobufs here allows uh, the token ring to communicate likely over gRPC and this allows the model to talk to each other so as it's transitioning uh, outputs between each of the devices right the outputs between each of the layers of the multiple multiplications uh, it can transmit those and that is likely what's going on there and we also have the hugging face hub which is a nice python library that lets you download in and upload machine learning models the binaries and the weights and things like that that's pretty straightforward mlx is the apple silicon hardware uh acceleration library that allows you to run matrix multiplications in the GPU of those M-based processors. NumPy is a C library that lets us easily, the, with the power of C in Python, uh, to access uh, faster math operations. 
So, and they also make it a little bit easier to do some of those math operations. Requests is a common library. If you're used to Python, you've probably seen this one a lot. It's a nice client re uh, client request system that makes HTTP calls for you and it makes it easy to deal with the HTTP protocol. Safe tensors is very likely what's being used to convert the output from every single uh, device and then it transmits that over gRPC so that you can convert uh, an output matrix into a safe tensor, which lets you save it onto a file or you know something that's easy to transmit and then it transmits it over gRPC. Then we also have tick token which kind of sounds like TikTok. The idea of a faster uh, tokenization um, and, and model that is a little bit faster than some others. TinyGrad is a, uh, a simplified version Actually, it kind of looks almost exactly like PyTorch, and it could be in some ways competing with PyTorch and Lib, uh, LibTorch in general. We also have another tokenizer here, which is uh, in tandem with the transformers. You've got tokenizers, transformers, and Hugging Face uh, kind of are all common libraries that we would see in machine learning models uh, for these large language models and other kinds of things too. So tokenizer will convert words into numbers that they can be can, uh, that are tokens based on what that word is. It's sort of like a dictionary look up system and then it will pass that through an embedding layer to find uh, relationships between those words and then tqdm is a python library that is actually kind of cool it's neat it's like a progress tracker you know those progress bars that show up uh, uh, on your terminal window that go boop, 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 up zero to 100 percent that's what that's used for uh, and then we've got uuid which <laughs> Uh, the ability to generate uniquely uh, any sort of universally unique identifiers. Um, and that's probably being used as identification for the token ring itself between devices. It generates a UUID. This is how I'd use it. Every device, right? Every device would get its own UUID and then broadcast it across the token ring. So that way every other device is aware how it needs to pass forward the layers between each of the outputs.